All right, well, welcome everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us at our first event of the semester for the First Generation Student Success Series. Um, today, we're gonna be talking about navigating academia for first generation college students, but you'll notice that we have first gen in um, parentheses, and that's because this information is really good for any student, um, but we are really approaching it thinking about first generation college students specifically. So today um, on the line, uh, myself, Dr. Carla Marquez Lewis, I am a distinguished lecturer and academic director for the psychology program here at CUNY SPS. And we also have on the line. Elizabeth Alsop, I'm the assistant professor and academic director of communication and media at SPS. I guess today, um, I think you saw a, maybe a note about this in the chat, but for any questions that you may have, you can go ahead and um, post them in the chat. Um, for any tech content related or technical questions, and there will be a dedicated time for Q&A at the end of the event as well. Um, let me go ahead and advance. So I'm going to get us started today with, with some of that content. Um, whoops, not yet going in that direction. Um, one of the things that we like to start out with is to give students um, a sense of why this event, why an event about navigating academia um, at all. I think our sort of primary impetus for starting this series was to do what we think of as demystifying the hidden curriculum of higher education. Higher ed is not intuitive, um, and it's especially not intuitive um, for many students who um, you know, are the first in their families to go to college. So one of the things that we want to really do is try to remove misunderstandings that can affect all students, but again, um, you know, particularly impact first-gen students. In addition, we really wanna build community among our first-gen undergrad and graduate students and alumni and faculty. I should note that many of our faculty also identify as first-gen. Um, we also wanna normalize asking questions. That is absolutely how we learn, um, not only in our courses, but really at every stage of, of our journey, our academic journey. And it's, um, it's actually a skill that you wanna build. And so there's never any, not only is there no shame in asking questions, it's, it's something that, that one should be doing um, uh, during your time um, at SPS and, and at any other academic institutions you might find yourself at. We want to, you know, I think the larger kind of goal here is really to empower you, to empower all students in their academic journey. Um, and in addition to that, we have kind of, I guess, maybe, a, I don't want to call it a selfish motivation, but we want to listen and learn from you as well. So we want to create spaces and opportunities to hear from you about what you might want to know, how we can further support you um, and meet your needs. Um, and I wanted to just quickly sort of segue before we get to kind of the meat of our presentation um, into talking a little bit about what I've seen, at least particularly in kind of um, uh, online spaces on academic Twitter as kind of some um, new awareness of first gen students and the challenges that they experience. Let me just advance now. So these are um, a couple of tweets I just screenshotted from two um, first gen faculty. These are professors who identify as first generation talking about how their experience as first generation students um, in turn has affected their own teaching. So one of the professors notes that as a first gen college student, I was so appreciative of professors who didn't assume I knew the professional etiquette norms of academia and took the time to demystify them. As a professor now, I genuinely enjoy doing that demystification work for students. And I know that um, Dr. Marquez Lewis and I feel the same way. And I imagine most, if not all of your faculty feel the same way, even if they don't identify as first gen. Um, another um, faculty member here talks about, and she, I, I loved what she did here. She said, I wish someone had done this for me in undergrad, especially as a first gen student. And she shows a PowerPoint where um, a professor is sharing the name of a theorist, Edward Said, but also including a pronunciation guide for the name, not assuming that a student will come in having the knowledge of how to pronounce that name. And I very much remember um, you know, going into um, a lecture when, when I was a student and seeing the name Socrates for the first time. And I knew how that was pronounced but because I learned that in high school, but I remember one of my friends said Socrates, right, and someone laughed at him. Um, and, you know, there's no need for that. There's no, there's no reason to assume um, a common base of knowledge. That's our job as professors to help, to help you um, to, you know, kind of make those things clear to you. I somehow managed to draw a yellow line on the screen, I think. Apologies, everyone, if you're seeing that, or maybe that's just me seeing that. Okay, good. All right, well, I'll go, I'll go ahead to the next slide then. So along the lines of, of demystification and not assuming, um, we put together this definition. It's a, a working glossary, um, and we're going to drop that in the chat um, so you have a link to it. I'm not going to go over all of these um, 
these terms, but I, I do want to go over the first few because I think they're important. And the first one is uh, syllabus. So I want to start out by saying that, you know, Dr. Alsop and I have given this talk before, um, and we have, you know, we originally put together the the glossary about a year ago, um, and syllabus wasn't on it. And, you know, it just goes to show that it, it's, we're always, you know, rethinking um, things. And, and, you know, as a first-generation college student myself, I did know what a syllabus was, but I had a student recently um, who didn't know what a syllabus was and didn't know what the term meant. And I know that to some people it seems obvious, um, but to many people it's not. It is a weird word. Um, there's no other you know place that you encounter a syllabus, right? Um, and so uh, I want to talk about first what that is. Um, so for those of you who don't know, it's fine. Um, a syllabus is really just this outline of the subjects in you know your course of study. It usually has like the course description, the textbook information, you know, your learning outcomes. Um, it could have grading criteria the schedule of the readings, the assignments, et cetera. But I always think about it when I talk to students as being sort of a, a little bit of a contract um, be, between you and me. So you know all the expectations for the class ahead of time, at least a good syllabus will, will give you that, so that there are no surprises for you. Um, and then you also know how I'm going to grade, how I'm going to be evaluating you. Um, and I know now that you have this similar information and we're both on the same page. So syllabus, you know, or plural syllabi are very helpful, both to students and to faculty and creating a, a good learning community. The syllabi that I that drive me crazy and probably drive students crazy are the ones that are like one page. They offer very little information, um, and it's okay to ask um, a professor if you can have a little bit more information or if you there's things that you're missing. You are entitled to that kind of information when you walk into a classroom. Um, the other terms, uh, prerequisites and co-requisites, um, get people mixed up all the time, and rightly so. They sound very similar. And a prerequisite is a course that you need to complete before you register for another class. Um, and then the co-requisite are courses that you can take together or that should be taken together. So those are two kind of tricky terms. And then the last one is office hours. Um, here at SPS, we call them student hours, or sometimes you'll hear people um, refer to them as student hours. They're really the same thing. Um, and it's really time that you as a student um, have access to your professor to ask them questions, to clarify. And we'll talk more about office hours or student hours. You're going to see that pop up a lot because that is time that you get to spend with your professor and that you have access to them to gain the information that you need to be successful in your classes. Um, there are also some other terms um, that you can see in the glossary. I won't spend you know, too much time going over them, but they really are about different departments and what, what those terms mean, um, different systems that are very specific to CUNY. Um, and then some of these other weird terms that you might see in some different cases, Z to C, uh, ZTC, OER, student evals, all of that. So um, please take a look at that glossary and um, we can circle back to some of that later in the Q&A. Great. Um, so yeah, succeeding in class, this is something that, you know, most students want to do and are trying to do. And sometimes one of the obstacles to doing it is, again, um, not being clear about expectations or understanding some of the terms, practices, conventions that we're talking about. So, um, you know, you've probably heard your various faculty members exhort you to read the syllabus, know the syllabus, print the syllabus. You really can't stress it too much just because it does contain so much of the information that you're going to need to know and refer to throughout the semester. So, um, you know, I always liked to print syllabi as students. I know printing is challenging in this digital moment, but at the very least download it, have it somewhere handy that you can refer to um, pretty easily. Same thing with your course materials, um, you know, especially for ZTC courses, zero textbook cost courses. Um, where materials will often be provided for you. So that's that's great, right? Free materials are excellent. Um, at the same time, it it's, can be tricky if you're waiting to kind of get your materials on a week-to-week -week basis. So be sure that you're thinking strategically about when you're going to download that reading from Blackboard. What if Blackboard crashes, right? It's better not to always wait until the last moment. So, you know, be mindful about um, leaving yourself enough time to order books you might need or download the course materials you need. Um, and obviously, it sounds... Sounds obvious, but um, we're all very busy. So it's good to know your deadlines and to plan ahead so that they're not gonna sneak up on you. So whether you use like me, an old 
paper planner or whether you're you know fully digital, um, it's a good idea to mark those things in your um, in your calendar ahead of time. Um, similarly, secure your tools. Um, you know, I do know that I have students that will try to do an entire course on their phones. Um, students across CUNY, their statistics show that a number of students do at least some of their coursework on their phones, and I completely get that. I do think that you're going to run into um, some challenges doing um, all of your online coursework on a phone. Um, and if you have a tablet, I think even you would want to have a keyboard externally for that. And it very, I think optimally you would have a laptop or a desktop. And um, we'll talk about this in the final slide, but SPS does have some technology resources available to you. They have a laptop loan program. Um, so that shouldn't be the thing that's getting in the way of, um, of, your, of your academic success. Um, find a space. Again, this is hard in New York. Um, we live in small spaces, but if, if you can't get a room of your own, um, you can at least get a desk or a nook of your own. I currently am in the corner of my bedroom. So I am a case study and carving out some space. Um, so figure out where you can study, if it's a coffee shop, if it's a, a New York Public Library branch, if it's a CUNY library, um, you know, just um, have that plan in place. Know your policies. Um, again, this goes back to the syllabus, which will include information about plagiarism, about accommodations, if you think you might need them um, for a documented disability. And this is last, but it kind of maybe should be first. Um, don't forget to check your SPS email. I know it's um, frustrating to have multiple email accounts, but a lot of really important information, including communication from your faculty, are going to come through that address. So make it a practice to check it. I suggest once a day to my students, um, but in any event, quite frequently. Oh, I think you're on mute, Carla. Yeah. Yeah, I got it. Thank you. You'd think after all this time, we'd figured it out. Have it. Um, so when I started college um, as a first gen student, I remember that some of the places that I struggled with the most um, were really the unspoken social practices of higher ed that I didn't know um, and no one tells you. And so I, I want to talk about a few of the things that students may not know. Um, and one of them has to do with titles. Um, what do you call your professor? Um, so I would often refer to them by the title professor, just because I, I didn't know what they wanted to be called. And it seemed like a pretty neutral term. Um, and then every now and then some people would say, oh, just call me X, Y, Z. And then that would clue me in. But even you know, professors sometimes forget to tell students um, what to call them, and they they forget that students don't know otherwise. So I always try uh, to say on the first day, um, call me X Y Z. So I have a very long um, last name because it's hyphenated, Marquez Lewis, and so I let students know you can call me Dr. M, you can call me Dr. M L, you can call me Dr. Lewis, Dr. Marquez, Professor. Any of them are fine, but. If you don't otherwise know, um, one of the things to do is ask. Um, you can ask your professor, you know, what should I call you? It's perfectly legitimate um, for you to do that. But a lot of times you can default to professor. Um, but one thing you don't want to call your, your um, instructor or your professor is by their first name, um, unless they tell you otherwise. And some people are very comfortable being called by their first name. And some people are very uncomfortable um, with it, especially in a professional setting, they wanna be referred to by their professional title. So it's a good idea to either ask if they if they don't tell you um, or just default um, to professor or, um, and professor's safe because not everyone's a doctor um, and you don't know that, right? Um, but it, professor's kind of a safe one. Um, so just a, a little FYI. Um, in terms of email etiquette, you know, I think this has become even more challenging in this day and age because we're so used to sending text messages to friends we're so used to being very casual in our communication and you really do need to sort of flip a switch um, in academia or in any professional setting to really solid um, email etiquette you open with a salutation right um dear doctor so and so or or you know dear professor or whatever it happens to be then you have your message and then your proper sign off, sincerely, best, best wishes, and your name, um, preferably your class um, as well. Um, I get a lot of students send me messages, and then I have to send, which class is this? Um, especially in the first week or two, right, um, until your professors know you. So just make sure that your email etiquette is always uh, follows this um, sort of guideline. And I think it 
what it does is it it establishes a very professional atmosphere and um, an open line of communication with your professor um, that they'll be very responsive to. When professors get emails that say, and, and I will tell you, I have gotten many of them um, that say, what time is blank due? That's the entire message. Um, you know, it's, it's, you know, surprising. Um, so I, you know, in those cases, I feel like it's my duty to really say to the student and a model um, by saying, Mrs. So-and-so or Mr. So-and-so or whoever it happens to be, um, are you referring to the XYZ best wishes, Dr. Marquez Lewis? Um, because that is going to translate into your working world as well. And I, I want you to do fine. I want all of my students to do fine. So it's a good place to practice too. Um, I think the third one is about assuming good faith. So it's not an adversarial relationship. I, I cannot stress that enough. Um, even if you think your professor is being quote unquote, not friendly or, or whatever the things I hear students say. Um, and there are professors who aren't warm and fuzzy, right? I mean, we, we all know that I've had that you've had that. Um, but it's still always important to assume that they're there because they want to help you and that they are your ally and they're your partner. Um, they're trying to get you to the finish line. Sometimes um, that does come in the form of being a little more um, harsh with feedback or, or things like that. And I mean only harsh, not in terms of style or tone. I mean, really, sometimes you get the paper marked up in red, right? Um, or nowadays we have online edits with Blackboard. But that is not to hurt you, it's not to make you feel bad. It, it really is to try and improve your writing. Um, it's a lot easier for faculty to not give you feedback, right? I mean, to uh, to just you know say, hey, great paper and, and keep it moving. It's easier on them, it's less work on them, but it's really not doing their job. Um, it's not helping you. And so they are, are really trying to help you um, with all this feedback. So assume that the relationship is in good faith. Um, the same goes for your classmates. No one knows what you're going through like your classmates. Um, so use them um, as allies. We have a lot of LinkedIn support groups too, um, based on the different disciplines. So join those. You never know who can help you get a job. I cannot tell you um, how many of our students at SPS have had some kind of link to a job or um, reference to a job or referral to a job based on a classmate um, in, in their um, graduate classes or their undergraduate classes. I will also say that um, being um, partners and, and having good relationship with your professors can also lead to referrals for jobs. Um, and you know, our own program assistant in psychology was a former student um, and I was her advisor. And um, you know, she she got the job because she was the best qualified person. But of course, you know, it helps to have relationships with people who can then say, yeah, I've seen this person's work and they're amazing. Um, reach out to your professors first if you have any concerns or problems, and then you, if you cannot get a resolution, go to the program director, then go to the dean, and don't skip skip steps. Um, so that's the order of sort of the chain of, of command um, in higher ed. The reason why we don't want you to skip steps is internally what happens is when the the dean gets your email, it goes directly down. Um, it gets sent to the program director. And then if it doesn't look like to me that you've you've um, tackled the problem with the professor, it goes down to the professor. Um, not your exact email, of course, but because we want to make sure that um, your your identification um, is is protected if it's something sensitive. Um, but it usually will start there and then it works its way up. So it's always going to get circumvented if you don't just follow the proper chain. Um, and then oftentimes it can be fixed at the very first level. So that's usually a good place to go. And then be mindful of your faculty status. This one is incredibly difficult um, and it is not a student's fault. There's no way that you know whether or not your faculty is a full-time member of the faculty, a part-time member of the faculty. Some of the faculty are um, adjuncts, many of them, right? So it means they have a full-time job elsewhere and then they also teach classes. Um, so they're working professionals like you. So it's just something to be mindful of um, that if your professor doesn't get back to you in you know, three or four hours, um, that a full-time faculty member might be able to because they're always based at the school. Um, but a part-time faculty member might only check email once a day. So always give them 24 to 36 hours to get back to you. And then finally, attend office hours. 
Um, this is the time to get to know your faculty. I sit in my office hours, and I'm sure Dr. Alsop has had the same experience, um, you know, just grading papers or hoping and praying and wishing that a student will come by. Um, and I get very excited when a student clicks on that button and they're in my Zoom room. And even if they don't have a question about class. Um, so sometimes a student will say, and I love these, I just wanted to pop in at the beginning and introduce myself. Um, my name is blah, 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 and here's why I'm taking the class. And then we just chit chat for a little while. And it's a really great way to get to know the student. Now we fast forward, um, you know, a year, and they reach out to me and say, can you write me a letter of recommendation for grad school? Um, you bet I can write a letter. And not just because I, I want to write a letter for you, but I have a lot to say about you because we've had lots of conversations and I can write about those in your letter. If I only see you in class, you never come to office hours, and I only read your discussion board posts, it's harder for me to do that um, for you because there's, there's such a limited amount of information I have. So get to know your faculty. We want to know you. Um, we really do. And just to add on to what Dr. Marquez Lewis is saying, I think what she said, I, I remember as a student having a lot of anxiety about the prospect of office hours. What would I say? Did I have to have a good question? Did I have to have some like brilliant insight into the material? And what she just said is really the only script you need. You can go click into the office hours and say, hi, I'm so-and-so. I just wanted to stop by and introduce myself. And the conversation will flow from there. Your professor will ask you questions. They'll want to know more about your interests, what your goals are after leaving the school. Um, you know, I've had students come by. I teach mostly film studies classes and just say, hi, I just wanted to see, I, you know, I just saw this movie last week and I wanted to get your opinion on it. So it doesn't even need to be germane to the topic that you were discussing in class that week. Um, anything that really, we love to talk about our disciplines, right? That's why we do this. So um, again, as, as Dr. Marquez Lewis said, we're really thrilled. Um, you know, that's one of our favorite parts of our job, I think. And I'll advance the slides here. Oh, the fun part, time management and self-care. Um, you know, our students, it, it goes without saying, I'll say it anyway, um, you're all incredibly busy. Most of you are working at least part-time. Many of you, the majority are working full-time. Um, so you already know about time management. So I'm probably not gonna tell you anything you don't know already. Um, and I know that, you know, in orientation, if you took um, that at SPS, you probably heard um, a lot of great advice and, and intel about how to manage your time. This is just some sort of anic data that we've gathered um, ourselves and, and some sort of best practices. Um, in general, I would say that the number one mistake I see students making is trying to take too many courses on top of a, of a full, um, a, a top of a full-time job. So um, we would say at most two courses while working is really the, the feasible max, the upper limit. Um, after that, you might find yourself really struggling and sacrificing, uh, cutting corners on, on one front or the other, or just exhausting yourself. Um, you know, so that's that's one thing that I think we all see. And sometimes students, particularly in their first semester, will really ambitiously sign up for five classes and then end up having to drop them and end up having to pay for part of the class. So be sure to kind of scope your work thoughtfully and with an eye to your own capacity. Um, I already mentioned calendars and planners. Everyone's got a different sort of system. Find what works for you. Experiment. If you're an old fashioned list maker, lean into that. If you like a particular app, go for it. Um, speaking of technology, I'm a big proponent of using technology kind of jujitsu like against itself. So um, use technology to limit your interaction with technology if it's a distraction for you. So personally, I use this program called Mac Freedom that actually turns off my access to the internet for certain periods of time. So I'll set it for 45 minutes for an hour. I'll write and then I'll reward myself by letting myself check email, go on Twitter, you know, whatever. Um, there are other apps. One is Pomodoro that sets like a little 25 minute clock for you. Pomodoro method. Some people swear by it. There's a lot of other time management tools. For me, the big takeaway um, when I discovered these was like, I needed to take this question out of the willpower arena because it wasn't, I wasn't strong enough, quote unquote, to stop myself from going online when I needed to be sort of on task. And I don't think any of us are. I think, you know, we're kind of addicted to these these little machines. So find, um, you know, don't be afraid, I guess, to use to use a, a technological tool to help you if you need if you need that um, support. Do protect your time. Treat your school work like you know you would your work for your job, right? So zealously guarded. If that means putting a meeting, a weekly recurring meeting, on your calendar for a certain time of the week where you know you like to do your work, do that, right? And tell your family, I am not available right now to the best of your ability. Um, set up routines that work. If you need to exercise, if you need to do yoga, if you need to take a bath, if whatever it is, 
you know, try to, um, to set up those structures that, you know, work for you and really stick to them and do take that time for yourself. I mean, I, I, I always wish, I, I would like to think that the pandemic taught us how important it is to really take care of our physical well-being and our, our bodies, um, but rest and exercise and sleep are not negotiable, right? So make sure that you're making time for those as well to the best of your ability. Yeah, and I, I do wanna add, you know, that um, the, the item about taking too many classes, um, it's not a race. And I, I know that that's easier, you know, to say because people need to get these credentials because oftentimes their lives are on hold or the promotions are on hold and that's going to lead to some better outcome for them and their family. And I absolutely get it. But for you internally, um, for your own psychological well-being, you should know and and hear me that you are not on anybody else's clock other than your own. Um, so, you know, give yourself some grace if you can't take four classes. That's okay. Most people cannot. Um, you know, we use the rule at SPS for undergrad classes, nine to 12 hours per class per week. But of course that fluctuates depending on the class and the person and how you're grasping the material. Graduate classes, 12 to 15 hours per course per week. Imagine if you're taking four classes as an undergraduate, that is 36 to 48 hours of coursework. If you have a full-time job, if you have children, if you are a caregiver, if you just have a hobby, I mean, that's almost impossible to do. Um, so don't let this idea that you have in your head, I hear students say all the time, I'm so behind. And it's because they count from the time that they, four years after they graduated high school, they're supposed to be here. You're only supposed to be where you're supposed to be, right? Um, wherever you are is where you're supposed to be, I guess is what I'm trying to say. So um, I didn't take four years to do my undergrad. I took six years, um, kind of cruised my way through. Um, but I will tell you that I absorbed a lot um, along the way. I didn't take four years for my PhD. That was another lifetime ago. I worked the entire way through. Um, so it took me a lot longer. And the truth is that it takes most people longer. That data that you see that four years uh, to graduate uh, to a undergraduate degree and four years to a PhD after that, those are long gone. Um, people are working now. And um, when you're working, it takes you longer. So, you know, don't be apologetic and um, just do it at the pace that is right for you and your life and your schedule. And the last thing I'll say is that the item about taking time for yourself, there is plenty of research that shows that you cannot sit in one place for two hours and just read and focus and study. Most people learn better in 15 minute increments. So 15 minutes and you take a break, even if it's to stretch and yawn, and then you're back at it get a drink of water, then come sit back down, but you do need breaks. Um, so allow yourself that. So another good tool is to create a plan. Um, and this is about accessing resources as well. So you each have an academic, um, academic advisor that is very unique to SPS. Um, so utilize them, utilize your program assistants, in your individual majors, whoever they happen to be, um, sit down, do a little planner sheet, even if it's going to change, um, figure out what, what is a, a way that you might be able to work through your program um, and your major, which classes are you going to take when, um, so that you can better plan your, your way through. Um, stack your credentials. And what we mean is try to get the most bang for your buck. If you're already graduating, I'll use psychology because it's what I know. Um, if you're graduating with a degree in psychology and you want to go into IO psychology, industrial organizational, for example, minor in business, right? It's going to give you that nice, um, you know, this, these two different credentials, and you're not going to have to use any more uh, credits. You're not going to have to stay any longer. You just use some of your, your general elective credits, and there's a pool of those credits that you have to just take a bunch of classes. Take a few of those credits and concentrate them in one area and walk away with another credential. So get really crafty and your academic advisor can help you with that or we can help you with that in the program. So just reach out and then work backwards from your career goals. So where is it that you wanna land ultimately? And now we're gonna make a plan by working our way backwards. And one of the ways that you can do that is think about, do you wanna to go to graduate school? Not everyone has to, so you shouldn't feel pressured to do that. If it is what you need um, based on where you want to go, you want to get a master's degree, you want to get a PhD, whatever, you need to start thinking about what courses you need to take. 
What exams do you need to take? What kind of recommendation letters? Um, and what kinds of tools do you have access to? At SPS, um, there is a group of advisors, or sorry, a group of um, directors of different programs, myself, Dr. Elsop, a, a bunch of different um, professors who've gotten together and put together a graduate school preparation series. Um, so there's preparing for graduate school, applying to graduate school, writing personal statements and CVs. And some of you might be saying, I don't even know what a CV is. And that's okay. Um, this academic resume or the CV We'll show you how to write them. So keep an eye out for different tools that might help you um, work your way forward after you've worked your way backwards um, toward your plan. The other thing is the emotional piece. And this is really the part that almost no one talks about um, with higher education. And you know, this was a very difficult piece for me a lot of first generation college students we talk to, this is the piece that they really hone in on. And um, in terms of the feedback that we've received so far, this is the thing that's resonated um, with them a lot, which is this emotional piece of, of academia that people struggle with. Um, one of those items is the imposter syndrome. So feeling like you're really not smart enough to be there. Everybody in your class is smarter than you. You're really an imposter. People just haven't figured out that you're faking it. Um, that sense of almost not being good enough to be where you are, not fitting in. I want to say that higher education by design is not for everyone. In other words, it's not everyone can act, can it can succeed, right? But it is not built for everyone. Um, a lot of times, if you are first generation students, if you are a minority student, whatever minority group that happens to be, a higher education doesn't feel comfortable um, to you. And so, of course, you're going to feel um, that you don't fit in. Um, you don't fit in, right? And so, it's really our problem in higher education to figure out how to fix that, not yours. Um, but just know that you're not alone and that because you feel that way doesn't mean it's true. It just means that you're experiencing, you're reacting to a faulty system um, that is being placed upon you. The other thing to sort of be aware of is this idea of code switching. And um, it really originated out of linguistics, this idea that people used to switch between languages, but it's sort of, um, it, it's really expanded to think about the ways in which people behave um, in certain environments. And we see it a lot in academia where people feel like they have to kind of switch who they are. Um, they shut off parts of themselves um, to sort of navigate more smoothly um, through academia. So, you know, to give an example, some of my students have shared, um, you know, they they say that they talk differently, right? When they're in an academic setting, um, they sort of shut off their the slang that they might use or the more casual way of speaking. And then they sort of take on their like school way of talking, right? Um, or they um, might dress a different way um, when they go to classes or go to, you know, um, school events than they would if they were just hanging out, right? And some of this makes sense, right? Because we do take on different personas. Um, and in psychology, we call it schemas, right? We try on different schemas for different situations. But I think code switching is a very exhaustive um, experience for people. And the problem becomes when people feel forced to do it. They feel like they're not going to fit in, that they they need to sort of lose this part of themselves to, to fit into academia. Just, again, know that it is a real thing, um, that exhaustion you're feeling by being on when you're in an academic setting. It's real. And, um, and you're not alone. You're not alone. Um, the other thing is something called um, ethical costs. And there's a book. Um, that you can you can get if you're interested. It's called um, Moving Up Without Losing Your Way, um, The Ethical Costs of Upward Mobility. And it's by Jennifer Morton. And she actually was a professor at CUNY for a while. Um, and she really talked a lot about the experience that first-generation students experience, um, the cost that it takes for that upward mobility. And there are costs. So remember that when people are living in two different worlds, the, the world of academia and the world of your family of origin or your community of origin, those two things may not align. 
Um, and so you may sometimes hear people say, um, you're trying to be X, Y, Z, or you think you're too good now because you're in college or, um, or you personally start to feel a little disconnected from your original community because you see things differently or you're feeling different ways about different topics. Um, that is also a very real experience of, of living in two different worlds and the cost that it takes to actually move forward, which sometimes means losing your connections with family, losing your connection with friends, um, feeling disconnected, feeling alone. You don't really live here. You don't really live there. You're just kind of somewhere in between. Um, so Morton's book really talks a lot about this and she has a lot of talks online too. So if you wanna take a look at some of those, you can look on YouTube um, and, and see some of her, her talks. Um, the last couple of things I'll mention are, um, it's always important to understand that there are intersecting identities that we all have. Um, so myself, um, I'm a Latina woman, first person in my family to go to college. Um, I'm a parent. I'm a you know a, a, a psychology professor. I'm you know all of these different things, and each of those things is creating unique issues, right? Um, whether it's caretake, you know child rearing or, um, or, or being a minority, um, whether that's the woman or the, you know, the, the sort of Latinx part of it, Wh whatever those intersecting identities are, whatever you have going on, it's going to complicate issues. And so, you know, again, higher ed is traditionally been built for certain people. And those people are white and they're men um, and they're usually between the ages of 18 and 21 and they don't work and they come from families that have money and that's not everybody um, who's in college now. So know and be aware um, that your issues are real and that if you're having problems with those, talk talk to us. Um, many people are experiencing those things. Find other people who are sharing those same experiences, whether they're classmates, um, students in clubs, we have um, multiple clubs that are sort of identity related, um, and you can find homes there as well. And then there are just going to always be personal and global challenges um, for you to be aware of. We just are, I mean, we're still living through a pandemic, right? I mean, that created lots of challenges for people at school. And a lot of times when you're a first generation student, you feel like it's because of you and realize that it's not you, it's it's everything else, right? Um, so the student who knows everything about college is also going through the pandemic, um, it's, it's not you. So know that, you know, we know that those things are happening. And if you feel like, is it just me or is it um, X, Y, Z? It's usually X, Y, Z. Um, so talk to us and, and we can talk to you a little bit about that. But the goal is really to, to think not in terms of deficits, things that you lack because you're a, a first generation student, but to understand that you also bring very unique experiences and you bring something to the table that people don't have, which is you and your background. So when you come to discussion boards, you're going to bring a different perspective. Um, when you come to conversations, you're going to bring a different lens that's not sitting there. Um, I always say to my students, especially my students who are first gen students or minority students, or, you know, we need you at the table. Um, we need you to get through undergrad and to, you know, we know that you can make it through graduate school. We need you to get there because we need your voice and we need your experience and we need you at the table so that you can then reach a hand back and and help other people like you. And I think the last thing I'll just say is um, you belong here. So, it, you know, don't ever feel like you're not supposed to be here because you didn't come from a family of people who have been going to college for years and years and years. Um, you deserve to be here. And if you need somebody to remind you of that, um, you know, reach out to any of us and, and we'll give you, you know, the little boost that you need, hopefully. Wow, I just wanna plus one everything Dr. Marquez Lewis said and just add one thing, which is, you know, um, she said this so much better than, than I could, but in addition to the psychological costs, the ethical costs, all of the sort of exhaustion that she talked about that comes from sometimes trying to conform to a system that wasn't made for you, um, you know, and really, I, I do often want to encourage my students to um, really try to let some of those preconceived notions about what 
an acad what a student should look like or sound like, particularly in their writing. I teach a lot of writing intensive courses. And what I found is that there are often academic costs for students who come in thinking, um, well, I can't write. I'm not a good writer. I'm a bad writer. Um, because they're, they have some sort of like specter or, or um, unfounded idea in their head about what good writing is. And what I've found is that often once students can kind of maybe like sweep away some of that imposter syndrome and those that they can really access their own voice, a more forceful voice, a more authentic voice, a more exciting original voice. And that comes back to Dr. Marquez Lewis's point about really needing those voices. They enrich the classroom, they enrich our society, they enrich you know, our world. So, um, you know, there are, I, I think we tried it a really sort of tricky line in thinking about this presentation today, because on the one hand, we wanna help you navigate this structure. At, on the other hand, we really want you to bring yourself to the structure too, even, though, especially because it wasn't made for you, right? And we want to encourage you to find spaces and ways um, to really, again, sort of, I know it's like a cliche to say, bring your whole self, but certainly bring the pieces of yourself that feel, again, authentic to, to your work and certainly to bring, um, to bring your, own, your own voice. And I try to work with students, um, particularly on, on how to do that in writing, because that's often such a space in which students have been made to feel, yeah, you're not writing standard American English, therefore, um, right, this is, this is somehow a deficit, this is somehow bad. And in fact, no, it's not. Um, so let me advance the slides here. Okay, I think this is me. Um, Student services, resources, all of these amazing things. I'm not going to go into too much detail because these all live on our website. Lots and lots of detail about um, each of these services. But we just wanted to quickly highlight the kind of full complement of, um, of free uh, resources that exist for you to take advantage of. Um, I started, I think I probably put the writing fellows up here first because I think there's such a sort of singular um, uh Kind of support that we offer at the school. Writing fellows are um, graduate students at the CUNY Graduate Center who have been trained specifically um, in writing pedagogy and the teaching of writing um, to work with undergraduate students at CUNY. So most of the CUNY campuses have writing fellows. Our writing fellows are wonderful um, and you can make an appointment to, to sort of work with them synchronously or asynchronously um, and they'll give you feedback on your paper at any stage of your writing process. So don't hesitate to reach out to them. Um, they are, I, I think, really a, a kind of gem um, in the CUNY system. We also have tutoring services in a range of topics. Um, we have um, career services I always tell students it's never too early to just get in touch with them, right? Particularly if you're interested in things like internships, they can often hook you up. They send out great email roundups of various opportunities. So make sure you're on their, their listserv. Um, one thing that I think is maybe particularly germane to our discussion, particularly in the last slide, um, is our mental health counseling. We have a wonderful head counselor, Dr. Erin Jeanette, who actually did a program with us last year on imposter syndrome. Um, and she, I think, has a, a team of folks, or at least a team of one who is helping her to provide um, free confidential consultations to students and, and if necessary referrals. Um, so you don't need to have you know, a mental health crisis to make an appointment to talk to Dr. Jeanette and just say, hey, I'm really struggling in some of my classes. I'm feeling like I don't belong or whatever it is that, that you find yourself contending with. Um, I think it isn't, you know, um, again, it's really wonderful that we have that at our school. We have, as I mentioned before, um, a disability services office who works with um, our students and our programs to support students who need accommodations. We have a laptop loan program, um, we, which is great. And I've actually personally helped get laptops mailed to students. Um, I've seen it happen and it's kind of magical and great. We have a reference librarian um, at the Baruch Library. We have a designated librarian that works with SPS students. The Baruch Library is like our library, um, Joseph Hartnett, um, and he's really helpful. Um, and again, I'm, I'm always happy to talk to students about library resources. I'm sure all your faculty are so thrilled when students wanna talk about the library. So if you ever are like, I don't know how to use a library, this seems really confusing. I don't understand how to access databases. Your faculty will help you, writing fellows will help you, uh, academics love to talk about libraries. Um, we of course have financial aid and scholarships offices and we, we did a great program with those folks last year as well about how to kind of finance and fund your education. Um, and I'll, I'll let Dr. Marquez Lewis talk in a minute about the first gen student success scholarship before we end. We have an emergency grant program and micro grants for groceries should you find yourself in a situation where you have a very short term kind of critical need um, in one of those areas. So again, I think all this information um, uh, uh, is, there's a link there in the chat that you can click on to find more details. And again, just wanna emphasize, 
There is no stigma attached to using any of these services. They are literally there to be used by you. Um, so yeah, do you want to talk quickly about the scholarship? Yeah, and, and remember, like, you know, a lot of times you you pay um, in your, your student fees for us to have all of these resources. So if you don't use them, you're sort of leaving like freebies kind of on the table. Um, the First Generation Student Success Scholarship is a scholarship that we started um, for students like you and mine. You do not have to already be, uh, you know, an SPS student for any significant period of time. You can be an incoming student and apply for that. But um, there's small grants that help students with books, um, you know, anything that they they need, supplies, um, et cetera. Um, so apply for the First Generation Student Success Scholarship. There's several of them. I think there were 10 that were given out um, this last year. So um, you really, the criteria is that you have to be a first gen um, student period. Um, and you'll talk a little bit in a few paragraphs about how that's impacted you. And then um, you really have to have a very minimal GPA requirement. I think right now it's um, set at 2.0. So it's not, you know, you don't have to have a 4.0 to, to get the scholarship. It's really there to help students um, to make the road easier for them. And the same with our emergency grant program. So many students um, don't realize that there's so much money that's just left there because students don't claim it. If you are in a situation where you cannot pay your rent, you've lost your job, you're going to get your lights turned off, your internet's about to be shut off, et cetera. And anything that will impact or impede your progress um, with your education, reach out um, because we may be able to get you some money um, to help you um, in these times of need. And it depends on the semester, but I've seen them give away as much as $1,500 um, to a student um, you know, who needed help with rent and things like that. So um, all of these things are there to get you to the finish line. Um, so anything we can do to help with that, we will. And with that, I think we're done with the sort of presentational part of our peach, a piece. Um, we would love to hear your questions. And maybe while you're gathering your thoughts, um, the events team just shared with me a question that someone had posted in the chat. So I'll read it out loud because I think it's actually a really excellent question. It's a tough one and a really important one. Um, so the question is, what are some ways to establish boundaries for ourselves and not give in to the idea that we have to work ourselves thin? How can we be more comfortable networking and receiving help when all throughout our lives being independent and self-sufficient has been encouraged and desired? I mean, this is like, this could be a whole course, honestly, right? Like this is, this is the, you know, um, this is, we live in a capitalist society, right? That um, encourages us from a very young age, right? To that kind of like rise and grind hustle culture. And I hear it from so many of my students who, have learned to take pride, right? And how hard they work, how little they sleep, how many classes they're taking. And I just sometimes wanna reach out to them and lay my hands on them, not in a inappropriate way, just in a like holding your shoulders way and, and say like, you need to rest, right? Rest, um, rest is also like, you know, it's very hard, I guess to, all I'm saying is to do that kind of counter programming because we really have been encouraged we, with this kind of American cult of the, of the individual, right? Not to um, not to rely on others, not to ask for help. The, the myth of the self-made sort of person. Um, so I I think just I'll just all of which is to bracket that off. That's sort of the psychological piece, which maybe Dr. Marquez Lewis could speak to as well. I think practically, um, you know, I think having conversations about this. I talk about my students. Uh, I talk with my students about this all the time, um, right? I, I try to open up a line of dialogue about my own work processes, you know, how I take breaks, how I take notes, when I schedule my writing time, right? We, we have conversations about, um, about, I guess, what we would call like structuring, right? Structuring our work. Um, because I think we all struggle with this now more than ever when we're expected to be on all the time, right? And some of our employers expect to be able to reach us on Slack or email or text or phone. Um, so it is kind of, I, I was just actually looking and I'll stop talking and let Dr. Marquez Lewis talk. Um, there's a wonderful um, scholar named Trissa Hersey who has founded a Twitter account called The Nap Ministry, and she preaches the gospel of rest as self-care, and she just wrote a book called Rest is Resistance. Um, and, you know, part of what she's getting back to is Audre Lorde's original idea of self-care as a radical act, right? Self-care doesn't mean buying more fancy bath bombs, right, from, you know, the body shop. It means 
um, particularly for marginalized folks, really taking care of the self because society won't necessarily do that for you. So again, this could be a whole semester. We could spend unpacking this really rich question, but Dr. Marquez Lewis, do you want to weigh in on this? Yeah, I mean, I would I would say that I, I think you you started the the question, I think embedded in the question was sort of the solution, which is um setting boundaries. Yeah. Um and you know, boundaries are it's tough um, to, to set boundaries. We, we live in a society that is ever encroaching on our boundaries. Um, you know, we send emails to people after hours. We, um, you know, we humble brag about everything on social media. Um, we look at people's, you know, false um, presentations of their lives um, that only make us feel worse about ourselves. Um, there's data to show um, that that kind of envy um you know, has really damaging effects on us. We read articles, I mean, even as academics where everything and, and students read them as well, that it looks perfect, right? And then the intimidation um, falls and you think, oh my gosh, I need to stay up all night and write like that. Um, those articles that you're seeing, those Facebook posts, those Instagram posts, all of that is fake. Um, you know, it takes years of processing um, revisions and rewriting till you actually see something in print, um, whether it's an article, a book, et cetera. Those people don't magically wake up and write like that. Um, people don't magically wake up and, you know, have a baby and have a perfect body. Uh, you know, people don't magically wake up and, and have, you know, whatever you want to fill in. Um, even the people who make it look easy, I guarantee you, they are swimming like crazy um, just under the surface of, of the water. Um, so I think one of the things is to not believe everything that you see. Um, it's not what you think it is. It never is. Um, everybody is struggling with something. Everybody is having a hard time, um, especially in the, this pandemic. If that showed us nothing, is that everybody's struggling um, with something at any given time. So it's not you. Um, they're struggling too. Um, they just make it look a little easier um, or they've curated um, their, themselves before they presented it. Um, so don't use other people in psychology. We call it, um, you know, social comparisons. Um, and the idea is that if you compare up, you're always going to feel worse about yourself. Um, and if you compare down, um, you'll always feel a little bit better. So I always tell students, you know, don't forget that you're doing a lot better than a lot of people too. Um, it will help sort of ground you a little bit and remind you that um, for a lot of people, I, I, you know, I said this once at a graduation ceremony, you are the upward comparison. Um, and so I think all of that is to say that you know, again, don't, don't believe everything that you see, because then it'll allow you to allow yourself more grace, um, to make mistakes, um, to, to give yourself an out to rest, to take a nap. Um, I love the idea of naps, um, to, um, to take a, a five minute break. And also I think the, the last piece is to vocalize that. So, um, you know, talking about resistance, um, you know, I, I hear, some, you know, I have some family members who would, you know, sit around and talk a lot about, oh, I worked, you know, 12 hours, uh, you know, each day for the last however many. And, you know, I just said one day at, at dinner, that's, that's really sad, you know, like it's, it's really sad um, because when you, you know, not to get too existential, but, you know, when you die, um, you know, are you going to, you going to wish you had, you know, worked a little harder, uh, you know, wish you worked a little more, or are you going to wish you spend more time with your family and more time with your friends, et cetera. So kind of being, a, I think a little more vocal helps to re reset people's own um, boundaries and expectations where people think like, yeah, maybe what I'm doing isn't healthy. Um, and then that'll make you feel a little more free. I think we all have a part to play in this. Um, and I think we're seeing it though, because in social media, you're seeing people start to post things, right? Without all of the editing. And, and that's making people feel like, oh, okay, it's it's okay to be me. Um, you're seeing people share a little more about um, the experiences they've had with higher education, um, having their children, you know, and you can name all of the things. And I think that kind of honesty makes people feel a little bit better, um, you know, about, about what they are or aren't doing. Um, so, you know, take with that uh, from that, what you will, but I, I think I agree with Dr. Alsop. It's, it's, it's a great question. Um, and probably, 
you know, maybe something we should do with Dr. Jeanette for a whole nother oh. topic. Yeah. Well, and we have another great question here. I would just say, you know, that that topic of great, that idea of grace that you brought up a couple of times, you know, I really try, I often will say to my students, like, look, I'm going to make mistakes this semester. And I'm, you know, I'll, what I'm going to do is, is I'll try my best to extend you grace when you make mistakes or need extensions. And, and I hope that we can grant that to each other, right? That it can be reciprocal because we're all just humans here, mostly trying to do our best. And I just put this in the chat, but a lot of things, one of the things my students struggle with a lot, I see is really just, um, you know, the, the inability to kind of say something is done and just good enough for now, right? There are times where I have students that are so close to the finish line, they're in their capstone and they just kind of can't let it go or they can't kind of just get that draft on paper because they're so paralyzed by perfectionism or the fear of failure. And, you know, honestly, good enough is usually, as I said, it's usually more than enough, right? You, this is really the work you're doing in your classes is not the culminating scholarly achievement of your life. It's really just the beginning. It's a chapter in it, right? So don't let yourself get too um, psyched out by setting really unreasonable expectations for yourself because um, your professors are not sitting there thinking like, oh, I can't wait to get this perfectly polished piece of writing, right? We want you to, to meet the expectations we set and we try to make those high and challenging, but we also are understanding that, that everyone is learning um, and, and in that process. So let me um, share the other question that came in. Um, Dr. Marquez Lewis, I'll, I'll toss this one over to you. What tips can you give on communicating with family who aren't supportive? Mm. Um, so I want to first say, for some reason, I can't see the questions. Um, so yeah, if you can let me know what they are. Um, so uh, family and friends that aren't supportive. I think this is a, a topic we we had talked about doing um, the the cost, um, the ethical cost. So a whole topic um, on that. I think it depends. Um, I think as with anything with family, whether it's politics, religion, um, you know, you're, it depends on how close they are to you, um, to how much you let it affect you. Um, and if they are very close to you, of course, it's going to impact you if it's your parents, et cetera. I think my number one sort of resource I would say is find another home. Um, and I don't mean physically, um, but I mean, maybe that group of people, whether it's your parents, your cousins, your siblings, that's not where you go for this. So you can go to them for all of your other emotional needs and whatever else you need um, for the love and support that you need there. But if they can't give you the support that you need for this, then you go somewhere else for that. Um, you join us clubs at school, you make relationships, you know, foster great relationships with your, um, your faculty, you find a mentor. Um, we're going to talk, um, have a, a talk in the next couple of weeks, um, about finding a mentor and, and, um, the helpfulness of mentors. And so I, I think that's a, a good thing to do. Now, I think simultaneously opening up a dialogue to talk to people. And sometimes it's as simple as saying, you're not being very supportive and, you know, I need these kinds of things um, from you. I think sometimes people don't realize they're not being supportive because remember that everybody comes to every situation with their own stuff. Um, and so sometimes you, you know, you don't even realize you're critiquing people or that you're making people feel bad or that you're not being supportive. It could come from your own insecurities. And I think sometimes it does come from that um, where people feel a little insecure because they didn't achieve the things that you're working on. I will say that there's a flip side to that too, which is that when you get so much support um, and everyone is resting all their hopes and dreams on you, and that can be equally um, scary and, you know, um, pressure filled for students. So, you know, I think there's, you know, a, a lot that can be done, um, but I think it depends a little bit on who the, who the people are, um, for the relationship, but utilize the other things that you have. Um, you know, it's good to have a toolbox, no matter what it is that you're doing or working on. And, you know, everyone can't be everything for you. So, you know, spread it around. That's great advice. Um, I think we're just about at time. So I want to ask if anyone else, if there are other questions, things that have been on your mind that you didn't get a chance to ask. I, I don't know if folks can come off of mute, but you're absolutely welcome to put a question in the chat. Um, or if you can come off mute, feel free to do that. And if you're shy, feel free to throw it in the chat. Um, and it, you know, even if you don't want to talk at 
this time you we we have our uh, first gen at sbs.cuny.edu and you can also send us an email you can send us an email anytime i know sometimes it takes time to process questions after the fact for sure um, well while folks are thinking if they have any last minute questions um i'll go to the last slide and just do a little preview a little teaser of our next event this semester um, Tuesday November 15th from 6 to 7 30 ish um, on the importance of mentors which we were just talking about um, with Dr. Bonnie Oglensky who's actually literally written the book or written a book on this subject um, I think this is really important because I think for a long time I know I had this idea that I would find like one mentor like a soulmate mentor um, and I was constantly being disappointed and then I realized like oh mentors can be like everywhere and they kind of are and you, having a lot of them is actually um you know kind of a really great strategy but it is a challenging thing that i don't think we're really taught to cultivate that relationship so um i, I personally am really looking forward to this event as well and thank you events team for putting the link in the chat last call for questions all right well i just want to say it was really lovely to see some of your little Zoom squares here. Um, and I really appreciate everyone for coming and taking time tonight. Um, and I hope that you will email us not only with questions, but if you have thoughts, um, feedback for us, thoughts about future programs you would like to see us offer, um, anything like that, we really would be very receptive to hearing from you. Yeah, thank you for joining us. Have a good evening. <laughs>